Hey, friend. Thanks for joining me again. Hey, it's Ashwin. So there's a bunch of stuff we have available to cover today, going even deeper into yeah. the shared interests of Tashin and QC. Yeah. Um, I want to maybe start by just juxtaposing uh, two of your tweets from this year. Cool. Um, one is from your thread about magic and this young adult novel that you wrote about. It's really about your life. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty deep into the thread, you said, one of my wackiest beliefs about Twitter is that I believe people come here looking for a tweet that will provide the exact right combination necessary to unlock their hearts. Often I have to write the tweet myself, though. If Teapot is about anything, it's this to me. That was in February. And then in April, at the beginning of last month, a month ago, you said, we sort of come here to Twitter because we're drowning. And there's one set of skills, concepts that is relevant to moving from drowning to treading water and a different set of skills that's relevant to moving from treading water to swimming to land. Um, yeah. I guess it strikes me that one of those is really about individual people. And, and then the second one is sort of about stages. And in that thread, you talk as well about uh, almost like the scene and what the scene as a whole is trying to do and not just individual people. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, do you have any thoughts about, about that? I can ask a specific question, but does that bring anything to mind for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can sort of describe, yeah, this is a great question. <laughs> I'm enjoying thinking about this question. Uh, I think when I, when I wrote that bit about like people coming to Twitter to find a specific key, uh, like, that 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 was sort of the beginning of a train of thought that has since kept going and i now have other thoughts so i can kind of describe a progression that uh, i at least went through and then i suspect other people have also gone through some version of this that is kind of like when i showed up on twitter there was something that i desperately needed specifically i was wrestling with a bunch of fairly specific heartbreaks and also just with this more general confusion I was just like okay I don't understand what's going on I don't understand what happened to me like a bunch of weird awful things happened and now I feel very upset and confused and it's all kind of like haunting me uh, and what do I do about all of that and uh, like that's sort of what I what I what I would what I had in mind in the second tweet when I talked about we come to Twitter because we're drowning like I was drowning I think a lot of other people Kind of show up because they're drowning they're just like ah what do i do i'm like suffering all the time in this like confusing way i don't understand uh, and then you come somehow you people show up because they have some sense that like ah uh, maybe there's something here that could address my eternal suffering like oh there are these people talking about ifs there are these people talking about psychedelics there are these people talking about self-love like you you find some point somebody shows up onto the scene because they like find something that hits them somewhere they're like something that gives them some kind of like oh like oh this could be i might i might need this like i might need this very badly um, and that and i think that instinct is good like i think when people think that they're on some level onto something pretty much every time like that there is something that they're needing or looking for there is like some kind of of wound or confusion or whatever that they're trying to to deal with and they come because they have some hope that like maybe there's something in the collective water here maybe some book or some teacher or some technique or whatever that could like help them with whatever it is uh, this is related to also uh on the list of topics uh that we could talk about this like puzzle without a name thing that i've been uh thinking about and, and talking a little bit about because like initially you don't understand what the problem is uh you just know that something feels bad like something kind of feels off or wrong somewhere and you're just like something's fucked up like somewhere something is fucked up and you are looking and because you don't understand what the problem is you have to kind of look very widely like I think people really rag on like doom scrolling as an activity but I think there's actually a lot of 
there can be a wisdom in recognizing that you don't know what you're looking for. So you have to look very widely and like you end up being being like following all the links and like opening a hundred tabs or whatever. But like, I think there's, there's some, at least some of the time, I think people are doing that because they recognize that they're looking for something, but they just don't know what it is. And so they're like, I have to look everywhere. I have to look in philosophy and psychology and psychedelics and all the, all the, all the places just like keep until I like find something that feels like it might be what I'm looking for. And then I think there's there's sort of after that is a kind of like you find at least one thing that's really good for you. Like maybe you find IFS and it's really good for you, or maybe you find psychedelics and they're really good for you, or maybe you find meta practice and it's really good for whatever. You like find at least one thing and it like clearly changes something. And you're just like, wow, I'm a different fucking person now. This is crazy. Like I'm gonna sing the praises of this thing on Twitter and talk about it all the time now. And I'm gonna like try to help other people get into this amazing thing, meditation, whatever it is, like emptiness like you can see it you can see this the kind of the signal of this on the timeline the person who's like i have found my first thing and it fucking kicks ass it's so good and they're right it does kick ass it is so good like uh and that sort of i think begins the kind of like more communal phase where you kind of like start looking for people that you can that to hang out with and kind of talk about this exciting thing that's going on for you and to try to just get some kind of like orientation, like, oh, now there's just like a process happening in me. Like I started meditating or whatever. And now there's just stuff happening inside of me that I don't understand. And like, now I'm looking for people who can help me just under, like, understand what sort of a thing is happening to me. So then there's a kind of like looking for help, just looking for help on this journey and looking for help understanding the nature of the journey. Just like what even is happening to me now? Um, and this part, I think, maybe branches a little bit. I think there are some people maybe who, like, get some stuff that's good. And then they're like, okay, I'm, like, I feel pretty settled. I'm going to just, like, go live my life now. And then some other people just kind of leave Twitter. They're just like, okay, I got what I was looking for. And now I'm going to, like, live my life. And that's fine. And it's fine and good. And I'm happy for those people. And there are people, I think, who, for whatever, for various reasons, stay. because the, Either because they're like, wait okay, I'm actually still suffering in a bunch of other ways, or there's still something else that I'm like, I feel like I need more stuff. This is like, I got like one or two things and that was great. But now I, I like have a desire for even more things. I want to keep understanding what stuff and I want to keep working through stuff and going through stuff. And paired with that, I think is a sort of growing recognition of like, uh, oh, like these people people here in this part of twitter are like oh they're like know a bunch of stuff and like we could talk about that stuff and there's like potential here for us being uh uh a force for good in the world in some way like we could be the guys who know a lot of stuff and have like experimented extensively with a bunch of stuff and try to share that stuff with the world and try to write about it or try to make art about it or in whatever way kind of spread the good stuff that we've got going on here so then that that points towards i think the more the more communal aspect of like, oh, this place is like in precious and important to me and I want to contribute to it and and protect it and, and help it grow. Uh, that was a lot of words in a row, but hopefully that was helpful. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah, you fielded a very open-ended question and hit it right back. I love that. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, could you tie in, you know, that one of the points that you've been on recently is, um, Develop sort of reconceiving the developmental theory stuff and um, bringing that back in, and um, you know, you've been talking about like redoing different Keegan stages, and that yeah, yeah, yeah. these are like meaningfully different things to go through. And can you just yeah. explain how did you start thinking about that in the first place? And can you walk me through maybe what what it would look like to be redoing different Keegan stages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So like again. This is an area where I sort of ultimately can only talk about my own experience, but mm -hmm. I do also, I have also talked to other people about their own experiences. And so I do feel some ability to be like, here's a sort of generalization of like kind of a thing that's happening for several people. So like, uh, like I think a big arc, certainly for me, and I think for many other people involves something like getting back in touch with your emotions or getting back in touch with your body kinds of things. Like you spent a lot of time growing up like very dissociated for whatever reason um there's like abuse and various other forms of trauma or just neglect or whatever like lots of different things could be happening and then you're like okay i don't i'm like 
dissociated all the time and I'm like depressed or I'm anxious and I like don't really know what I want or who I am and I like don't know how to have boundaries and all of my all of my romantic relationships are mysteriously bad <laughs> like <laughs> kinds of things you know not that I would know anything about that <laughs> you know and then you come across some stuff right like maybe you come across like attachment theory or like you come across some person who is like hey there are these things called boundaries and maybe you should try having some <laughs> and you're like whoa wait holy shit fuck and like you know you like there's a lot of different ways this could go. Like maybe you you do some somatic practices. Maybe you do some IFS. Maybe you do some bioemotive. Like any kind of like, oh my god, I like have feelings. I like feel angry and sad and scared and confused and anxious and disgusted. Like there's all these things that like, and maybe some of those feelings were like things that you never thought that you could feel or things that you thought you weren't supposed to feel. Like oh, I'm not. I think not. I'm not supposed to get angry is like super common, extremely common among you know people around here it's very very common to have lots of problems with anger which is is very interesting and we can we can talk about that if you want um extremely common and then and there's just this process of just gradually accepting like yeah i'm like a human being who feels literally every feeling that it's possible for a person to feel like all of that stuff is just stuff that i felt and some of it is stuff that i've like prevented myself from feeling and then it turns out all this stuff is kind of like still there and now i have to go dig it up again you know this gets into like shadow integration kind of stuff like all sorts of different existential kink like million, like a lot of different ways of kind of one way or another being like i'm like a human animal and i get scared and sad and like i need to move my body and like all this all this kind of stuff and like you can sort of i have been kind of conceiving this developmentally there's maybe two aspects of it uh like I've been labeling this redoing Keegan three, but some of it is actually redoing Keegan two. Um, not that I'm familiar with the distinction, but Keegan two has to do with like, uh, at Keegan two, you're like very selfish in a certain way. Keegan two is just like, you just like have wants and desires and you're just like trying to get them met. And other people are like either hindered, they're either helping you get your wants and desires met or they're not. And so Keegan two has this flavor of like pretty young child, like toddler kind of energy. And I do think there's a, there's an important way, like if you, you know, if like your childhood was messed up in a way, like if your parents couldn't care for you in the way that you needed to be cared for, like there's, I think a part of the, and a really important part of the process of the journey or whatever is in some way sort of going back and redoing childhood and like going back and like, okay, what if childhood, but this time I actually got the care that I needed. And, um, like depending on exactly what stage of childhood like that ends up looking like for example a very strong focus on feelings like if you if, if in your child is this is certainly the case for myself if in your childhood like your feelings weren't cared for and your parents like didn't really care didn't really attend to them or like make space for them or like help you learn how to deal with them they might be like i have to go back and redo all that stuff i have to like kind of you know, let myself be very childish in a lot of ways in order to like get to the get to the being to being able to like, oh my God, I'm like allowed to have feelings. I'm like allowed to like be irrational or whatever. I'm like allowed to be really angry about stuff that kind of doesn't make any sense. But it's just, you know, there's a part of me that's angry and like I'd rather let it do that than like continue stuffing it back down. So that's like a whole journey that one can go through. And I think people like can kind of get stuck there and sort of not like like after redoing childhood comes like redoing adolescence which is just a different thing and it maybe it's easier to talk about this than in terms of keegan stages because keegan stages are like a little i don't know they're like a very specific system but everyone has a sense of like what it was like to be a kid and what it was like to be an adolescent like adolescence is like very uh like there's a couple different things that happen in adolescence, right? You like start to identify with your peers more. You, you're trying to like figure out your place in society. You're trying to figure out like who you are and like sort of what your role is. Like what you want to major in in college, that kind of thing. You're trying to figure out how to relate to other people. You're trying to figure out how to relate to sex and romance. Like these are all very like powerful adolescent themes. And they're different from the themes that you deal with as like a six-year-old. It's just like a different set of concerns. And uh, 
and it just requires slightly different material like what's an example um Okay, so another thing you might do as an adolescent is you might take on creative projects. Like when I was 13, I started trying to write like poetry and like short stories and stuff like that. Like there's a creativity. Um, and I think the the kinds of stuff you need to, to get to the point where you're like, I'm going to start doing projects and like making commitments to do work with people. That just requires a different of skills than the, the part where you're like getting back in touch with your feelings and your body. Like you start needing to sort of ask yourself, like, what do I care about enough that I'm willing to like tolerate discomfort and I'm willing to tolerate like having to work hard on something, even if I don't necessarily feel like it and like, or willing to like work through like emotional blocks that come up until I get to the point where I'm motivated to work on this project again. Like sort of what am I willing to like there's a there's an aspect of the I'm I'm sorry I'm still talking so much, but okay. it's just this is the long there's just long thoughts here. There's an aspect of the like earlier developmental like younger child stuff that like I think when when people really go on about non-coercion and stuff like i think that's often pointing to if you were coerced a lot in childhood and people were like your parents were like constantly making you do stuff you didn't want to do and it felt bad in a lot of ways and and part of redoing that can involve a, like i'm allowed to want what i want i'm like allowed to go pursue the things that i want and not pursue the things that i don't want like i'm allowed to have boundaries etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all fine and good. And that's like really good and important. And uh, there's a later point at which you're like, ah, if I like commit to doing like a project, like I have to like, there's something about like learning how to make commitments without using coercion in a certain way and this is like subtle stuff and it's hard to find good words for talking about this but there's a difference between like bullying yourself into 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 like uh fulfilling your commitments and like committing to them there's just like a different thing that commitment is i think uh and it should like it shouldn't feel like the other thing it shouldn't feel like an internal tyrant it should just feel like, ah, this is like a thing that I care enough about to connect to it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's like another long info dump. <laughs> Hopefully mm. that was helpful. Mm -hmm. It is, yes. I had some clarity coming into this conversation that it seems to me there's like three scales that I see you operating at. We're mm. like, on one scale, you're like just doing your thing for you, where you're like trying to process, you know, the heartbreaks that you said you had and like, you know, express yourself creatively and, uh, you know, like live your best life just for you, you know, and um, like on your own terms. And that's one thing. And then I see you connecting with, you know, specific people and, um, you know, like developing friendships and, uh, you know, attending to other people on their terms as well. Like, it's like, oh, this is specific. Like you're having a conversation with Tashin right now, you know, <laughs> like that's mm -hmm. a different conversation than you'd be having with someone else. Um, and then, but I also see you sort of zooming out and attending to the, like the scene or the group as a whole and being like, well, what, what even, what's the weather with the group as a whole? Like, never mind mm -hmm. a specific person and like, what are the trends and, um, it seemed like that was part of the thesis of this, like redoing different stages of like, oh, it seems like a lot of people were doing this other thing a while ago. And now people are moving on to this new thing where it's like maybe redoing st stage four, or, you know, something else. And uh, maybe people should have yeah. projects or something. And um, yeah, what, yeah, is, yeah. what is it that you're seeing on the scene level, like for the group or the people in our neighborhood, as it were? Yeah, thank you. Like, it helps to hear that reflection because I do 
I have kind of been conceiving with myself is operating on different scales, but that's a very helpful way of breaking it up. So thank you for that. Um, I so I guess like concretely, one of the places this came out of was like uh, so before January or so of this year, like last fall and winter, I was in like a very bad depressive period, and uh, like that was sort of maybe where a bunch of this stuff that I'm on about now was kind of gradually uh, building up and kind of wanting expression and couldn't really, like the seeds of it were somehow planted during this period or before it. Um, like I was wrestling with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. I was like looking back over my life and just feeling like a failure and just like, wow, I've like failed at like everything that I've ever tried to do. It was not a good time. Um, and I was also feeling like I didn't uh I didn't post on Twitter that whole time like something about being on Twitter was just overwhelming and then in January like I had sort of recovered enough to get back onto Twitter but I was still very unhappy and so there was a period where I was just posting really angry dark stuff for a while and I'm like god oh, this is kind of the best I can do right now so this is where we're at um and during that period I felt very alienated from Teapot like it felt like the rest of, I mean and I wrote about this in the in the so you want to be a wizard thread. It was like, I felt like the rest of the teapot was kind of this like little dance of love and light. And people were like, oh, everything's so good. I'm like so happy or whatever. And I'm just like, <laughs> like, what is this? What are these aliens? Like, I don't understand how to relate to these people anymore. Or like, I don't like, they were like, it felt like they were like playing a game that I no longer could join in in any real way. And I was just like, well, I guess I'm just sitting over here by myself being angry. Mm. And that's, what's happening or something and it felt to me and i'm curious how it felt for other people but to me it felt like when i wrote the big thread the so you want to be a wizard thread like that kind of opened up something um in the rest of teapot i think like and i heard some people say i heard some people like i like i've had at least a couple of people dm me to be like wow this was like very refreshing and say like oh man it's felt to me it's also felt to me like teapot has been kind of missing uh like darkness or something that there's been like too there was like too much light and not enough darkness or something and there i had a couple people express gratitude for like thank you for for bringing in more of this like rawness and darkness back and i was like nice to hear i was like oh i'm glad i'm glad this was helpful for you and that feels related somehow like it it, it sort of helped me get a sense of like oh, like something might be missing in Teapot and like maybe we could try to find out what it is and then bring it in. So that was one of the inputs. Another one of the inputs, and this ties into another one of the topics that we might talk about today. Another one of the inputs was after writing the big thread, I was contacted by Crystal, Crystal Dwan, who was I had not heard of before, but she's like been around. And we had just like a bunch of very intense conversations about like God and being Asian and a bunch of other stuff. It was very good. It was like really extremely good conversations. I was like, they were like psychedelic for me. And uh, part of the output of those conversations, like after the combination of writing that thread and also having these conversations, I was like a little hypomanic again for the first couple of weeks maybe of March, it felt really good. I think I like wrote a bunch of, I wrote a bunch of like really good stuff while I was in this state. And that was being fueled by this sense that I had like, uh, I'm not sure how to describe this. Like, I felt like I maybe understood something about God that I didn't understand before. And this is gonna be like, I don't know how to talk about this, um, but there was some kind of like, So I've been thinking about harmony, like social harmony. Like what does it sort of mean for people to be harmonious with each other? And what, you know, when when people are disharmonious, you know, like you look out into the world and you're like, how harmonious is this right now? You're like, probably not very. Seems like people are fighting and arguing all the time and nobody can agree on anything. And nobody, and like people don't seem to have very much hope. 
for the future and everyone's just kind of like panicking it's it's not it's not good it's not good out there and so for me this this there's the question that's that's become increasingly urgent that is something like you know how does one go about harmonizing people just generally like how does one go about and I'm, and I, I I take the I take the musical metaphor very seriously in a sense of like 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 people are sort of singing their like their energy is kind of like a song of like a happy feet basically I take happy feet very seriously <laughs> as a metaphor for life like everyone's kind of got their song going on and then like people can kind of like you're singing a song and then someone else is singing another song and you can kind of like once you kind of like meet each other you can kind of like jam to sort of see if your song and their song can kind of coexist in harmony together and so I was like okay that's great but like how does that kind of scale like how do you get people to agree on things and like the sort of the like the obvious like maybe not the obvious but like one sort of simple way that could happen is like someone is just really insists on their song that like my song is the correct song and other people should be singing my song they kind of like try to overpower other people's songs with their song so to speak like this is a metaphor for energy or something uh for like personality vibes whatever like philosophy they like try to overpower everyone else like okay i'm gonna like kind of be a bit of a dictator or a cult leader or whatever i'm just gonna try to convert everyone to my thing and that's how i'll achieve harmony by through achieving something that strong more than harmony which is unity right like there's a difference between harmony and people singing the same notes so this but the simplest way it can go is we'll just get everyone to sing the same thing and that will be how we achieve harmony but that's like pretty boring and bad that's like bad and boring like it's not a very rich song for everyone to be singing the same note at the same time. Like that's a that is a form of harmony, but it's a, the most boring form of harmony. Um, much richer is you know actual harmony, which is people singing different notes that sound good together. Like that's what harmony is. And like yeah, this is like very unsatisfying for a number of reasons. I'm like I don't think this will work. I don't think we should try to bully other people into singing our song. It just doesn't seem to work very well. And it's ethically bad <laughs> so so then then like i have been sitting with this question this was a this was a this was a this was like an image that came to me uh last summer on drugs and i've been kind of sitting with it this whole time and then i feel like i got i felt like i got sort of a new kind of idea about it in march from talking to crystal which was something like um uh, this was also related to getting back into singing for myself and kind of finding that like oh wow there's like something really powerful in singing for me with like oh there's like some kind of a connection to something bigger than myself that I can kind of feel sometimes if I sing the right things and and so then it came to seem like ah there's sort of a there is a kind of maybe divine music that I can tune into I can kind of listen for this kind of divine music and the difference between the divine music and other music is like when I listen to it, I feel myself cohering. Like I become somehow more coherent. Like that, that the different discordance, like conflicted parts of me suddenly snap into alignment and are just like singing this beautiful song together. Like that, it felt like that had happened to me. Um, that I had somehow like become less scattered like my energy had somehow every, everything had started kind of like working together in a way that it wasn't before and um not because i had like decided what not because i had decided what to do but because i had decided to start listening to this thing this thing that was kind of outside of me um, and i felt it just felt like everything had simplified like the quest like the like questions of like what to do and like what to prioritize and sort of who I was or something. All those questions felt like they simplified in a way that I don't really know how to describe other than with this, this, this image of like, I felt like parts of me just felt moved to sing in harmony with whatever this was. Um, like I didn't have to force them to do it. They were just moved to do it. Like it touched them and they wanted to do it. And I was like, ah, maybe that's how you get societal harmony is instead of trying to like, like, this is my music and everyone should do my music instead of being like ah there is already a music that we can all tune into and that we all find moving that all of that, that that moves us to be in harmony with it 
And so rather than needing other people to be in harmony with me, I try to tune myself to whatever this divine music is. And then other people see it in me and then they are moved to also tune themselves, not to me, but to the divine music. Anyway, that was, I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. It does. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, I think I know what to do now for some value of no and for some value of do. And so that's that's kind of where this this idea to sort of focus on harmonizing teapot came from. It's like, it's like okay, Vibe Camp is coming up. I think Vibe Camp could be extremely good this year. And what can I do to prepare for that, to like help everyone to sort of seed, like seed conversations and interactions during Vibe Camp. I was like, well, I can try to like harmonize Vibe Camp's energy, not Vibe Camp's, Teapot's energy. I can try to like harmonize Teapot's energy and like empower other people who are also doing that already to just keep doing it, but harder. Um, like this is when I was tweeting stuff like people should like, the question is how to circulate the energy and the answer is art and stuff like, and then when I was tweeting the stuff like now would be a great time to stop holding back. Like I wanted everyone to like take their place in the music and to like, just really go for it. Really wanting that. And I was wanting to like spread that vibe. Mm -hmm. Just like everyone just like really blasting the music. With mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a uh, such an interesting arc. I mean, there was this long period of silence for you, where you're sort of in hibernation and this depression, and then you know you came back and we're, as you say, talking about like uh, dark themes and like oh, teapot's missing this, and like oh, it's not love and light, and you know, I, I uh, for what it's worth, found that very helpful and refreshing and uh, good, and have. Um, you know, looked at that in myself over the last year. And so it, it was like, oh, I, I see this. And um, this is this is great. I remember specifically when I read the So You Want to Be a Wizard thread, I'd like woke up from an app. I was like, oh, treats from Chow Chu, good. And I was like, oh, this just, I just like remember, I was like lying in bed and I was like, I was like scrolling and scrolling. This was so good. I was just like, oh, I can't stop reading this. So good. Uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, but then, and then, and then to have that transmute into suddenly it was like, God, devotion, you know? Uh, and I forget the exact tweets that you had about that, but, um, and of course there are some, you know, private messages that we exchanged and I was seeing as well, but um, what, and yeah, it's hard to talk about, but like, um, you know, you started talking to Crystal, as you say, and like, what what unlocked there for you? What, how did that start to unfold to the extent that you can speak about it? Like, where, where did God come from? Tell me more, Chachu. I mean, on some level, it was just that Crystal talked about God a lot. And I was like, wait, I want to talk about God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it was just, it, it, on some level, it was just a kind of, dem like, she just kind of demonstrated to me that it was a thing that a person could do. I was like, whoa, okay. Like, this is just like a thing that I could do. And specifically, I think there was a block for me. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to double check the timing because I'm not sure what order a couple things happened in. Um, but like there was a block for me around using religious and God language of like, oh, like God and religion is like Christianity, which like is a like a thing that they told me was bad when I was 10 years old or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, like that had kind of been preventing me from taking those ideas seriously or like uh, there was some kind of way that was like, oh, yeah, that's like cool kids don't talk about that or whatever. <laughs> But then that block just kind of dissolved, I think, while I was talking to Crystal, but I don't remember. And then I was like, oh, wait, that was stupid. Like, I didn't mean any of that stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, it's it's hard for me to explain, but my brain was, like, very malleable for a couple of weeks there. And it was just, like, easy to, things were, it was just easy for things to shift. And that was one of the things that shifted. I was just like, oh, yeah, I just, like, don't have to, I don't have to stick to that conditioning at all. And then there was a course bonding thing. Like, I also don't have to believe what any particular Christian has to say about Christianity either like I can there was there was a thing that I kind of decided in myself that was something like I could be a Christian heretic if I want to be or like I don't have to like devote my life to Jesus but I can at least be like an acquaintance I can hmm. like come to know Jesus and be like hey this guy is pretty cool he's got some good stuff I appreciate him and like be friendly at the very least 
that was part of it. And then another thread that fed into all of this was that I don't remember if I've talked about talked about this elsewhere, but I I was noticing patterns in what I cried about. And for a long time, that was like almost exclusively kind of stuff about love and relationships and, you know, girls and things like that. I was like, okay, that all makes sense. I understand why I'm crying about all of that stuff. And then I started crying about God. Like I, I almost cried once last summer thinking about talking to Jesus. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was very surprised. I was like, that's shocking. I had no idea that that was a thing that I wanted. Um, like it was not, it was not like, it wasn't compatible with my self image at the time. So I shied away from it. But I'll, I also took very seriously the fact that I felt this like strong sense of grief. And it's like, ah, uh, okay, I'm going to bookmark this to look at later. There was also during the depressed period in I think around November, I watched this movie um, on Netflix called Child of Kaminari Month. It's very sweet. And there's a scene in that movie where the main character talks to this dragon spirit about how much she's suffered. And the dragon spirit says something like, I also know what it is to suffer. And then I started bawling. <laughs> it was like and I tried to like I tried to describe to myself like why why this was bringing giving me like why I was reacting so strongly just because I didn't understand it was like and the words that came out were something like the idea that God could know my suffering I think that's the that's as much as I was able to say before I just started crying again and I was just like okay apparently there's something very powerful here from that. So there's some kind of thing that I'm very drawn to around like, wow, imagine that if God can know my suffering. That would be fucking crazy. That would be like, that would be deeply meaningful to me in some way. And there's a couple of other things like that. There's this passage in um, this fantasy series that I could, I could quote, would you like me to quote the passage? I could try to find the tweet. Sure. What's the series? Uh, it's called Kushel's Legacy. And it's about magical French people who have a lot of sex. But there's this one section uh, that's really beautiful and has stuck with me for a long time and that I've cried about a couple of times. Uh, yeah, this is actually in the in the thread where I, over the summer, was like, I kind of want to talk to Jesus. So there's, there's a, yeah, so there's a lot of context for this moment, but he is, there's this character named Berlick who like committed a horrible sin, basically. And um, he starts out, he like converts, sort of converts to Christianity. And he has this to say about it. Um, he says, I do not know if it is presumptuous to call a God a friend, but if there is any God who would not mind, it is Yeshua ben Yosef. This is, that's Jesus. When Ethan first spoke of him, I thought it was a terrible thing to worship a God who let himself fall so low, who let himself be mocked and struck and hung to die like a criminal. But I came to see it. I came to see that he is the one God who understands what it is to fall low. That when every other face is turned away from you, he is the friend who is there, not only for the innocent, but for the guilty too. For the thieves and murderers and oath breakers alike, Yeshua is there. And uh, that was very striking to me at several points. And I've cried about it a couple of times and I mean, I mentioned I was I was dealing with a lot of guilt, but just intense feelings of guilt. And this was like one of the only things I'd found that had really done anything in the for, to shift that intense feeling of guilt. Uh, so that was that was powerful. And then I also cried about uh, the there's the song in the Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, God Save the Outcast or God Help the Outcast, that Esmeralda, Esmeralda sings a prayer. It's just a prayer that Esmeralda is singing, and it's very beautiful. And there was a there was a moment in my process, and I think this also was in March, where I was I just wanted to look up that song. It's the lyrics from that song were, were sort of haunting me, and I then I just like listened to it and sang it, and then cried about like five different lyrics in that song. <laughs> So that that was at this at that point I was like okay this has happened like six times now I like 
pretty much believe that something about this is deeply important to me. So I'm just going to keep following it to see where it leads. Um, so that was like several different uh, kind of hints that I had been getting. I was like, okay, I got to, I got to, it's time to, it's time to consider God and, you know, sin and forgiveness and Jesus and all of this other stuff. What does God mean to you now? I don't know. I think I'm currently kind of in this phase of like, sometimes there's stuff that feels like it needs to gestate for a while in the back of my head without really being touched and specifically without really being touched verbally. Um, like with God in, I mean, this is true for a lot of things, but I think it's especially true for something like God, like mm -hmm. with God in particular, it's so easy to like let the words kind of distract you from the thing. And there are so many different words that a person could use and that other people could use. And this is obviously like an incredibly touchy subject for a number of reasons. Like we, mm -hmm. a lot of people in this network are ex Christians. And so there's just like a lot of very heavy karmic stuff around this word god um, which is why i don't use the word very much on twitter because it does it just feels like it's going to be i don't know a little more inflammatory than it would be helpful but like i have this sense right now that i'm kind of like wandering away from explicitly considering that topic to considering other topics but like it's all kind of part of the same tapestry and i expect to come back to it soon or later um Right now, it feels like I'm focused on more down to earth stuff, but it's all kind of in service. Like, I am trying to be of service in some sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like the whole thing kind of shifted my orientation towards being of service in a good way, I think. Hmm. I can't really, I don't know how to describe the shift, but something about a shift that was helpful. Hmm. How do you so see yourself trying to be of service now? Yeah, see, this is another thing that I sort of hesitate to put into words. I'm just like, I would rather just do it than talk about it or something. Mm -hmm. Like, in some sense, I worry that talking about it is a distraction from just doing it. And like, like I'm aware of the dangers of... I'm I'm at least somewhat aware of the dangers of like spiritual materialism and people who are like, oh, I'm so enlightened or whatever, but are just kind of assholes and just aren't very good people. And I'm just like, I would like to not do that. So like, I would like to attempt to cultivate and maintain humility or something. Like something about that strikes me as very, this was like another thing that I kind of got out of thinking about God, was thinking about humility and Yeah, so I, I I don't want to present myself as, on some level, I don't want to present myself as like, oh, I'm like on this mission for God or whatever. It's like, that seems like a distraction from just doing it. Um, I would rather just do it and then like show people what I mean. Um, but if I were to try to put words to it, um, I think there are two main ways that I help people through my writing. There's like, on the one hand, um, I'm like willing to talk very honestly about experiences that many of us have had, but that are hard to talk about, um, that are embarrassing or just very vulnerable or whatever. And I'm just like, whatever, I'm going to talk about them anyway. And I think that's that's sort of always been a strength of mine. Or always, always like relative to like, always since I got on Twitter has been a strength of mine and people really uh, like I got a lot of amazing responses from writing the magic thread the, the so you want to be a wizard thread people were like way more people than I expected as in as in like 10 ish which is I expected one or two maybe but like 10 ish people wrote to me to be like 
holy crap, like I have experienced something like this and I didn't know how to describe it. And I didn't think anyone was ever going to describe it. So thank you for describing it at all, even a little bit. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that I could, I can provide that, that service. Uh, and I'm, I am like, I would like to basically continue doing that. Like there's more stuff. Um, I have plenty more just stories to share that I think could be helpful to people. And this, this also, also like um, more recently, there's been, you know, renewed interest in like Yudkowsky and nationality and people showing sort of showing up to these ideas for the first time being like, what the hell is going on here? And so like old threads that I wrote about my relationship to the rationalists and so you and to yet and stuff have been going around and I'm I'm also glad that I can like help people in that way. It's, like, people have been contacting me to be like, oh man, like thank you. I also have a weird relationship to the rationalists or like I also read HP Amora when I was too young and it fucked me up. And so I'm also glad that I can help those people. So that's like sort of the simpler way that I help people through my writing. And I would like to keep doing that. And also like I do think of myself as on some level an intellectual and of the project that many of us are engaged with on Twitter as on some level an intellectual project. Like, I think we are trying to build a new understanding of like what it is to be a person and what it is that people ought to do. Like it's a philosophical project, but in a very concrete practical way of just like what it is like what are we doing here like what's the point of being here like what are we what are we here for um what is like like how does one go about like being a good uh a good lover and a good husband or a good wife or a good father or a good mother like how does one go about just doing good in in the world in a very concrete way and i think we have an op opinions about those questions and that those opinions cohere into something into like a a philosophical and psychological and spiritual platform that can be articulated and built upon and uh i i think my maybe my main contribution to that project so far has been just writing a bunch of stuff about emotions and just being like very clear about and trying to be very clear and standing up for very specific aspects of what it means to engage with one's emotions, to be with one's emotions, to respect and honor one's emotions, um, specifically as a corrective to a lot of ways in which people grow up being told that their emotions are unacceptable or that they're too much or that they're too, you know, that they're just uh, growing up being told that your emotions are wrong in various ways and then me being like, actually, no, how about we don't do that? Uh, I think that's most of what I've done so far. And I think that there are just more things to do that are like that. Like there are just more kind of um, more ways in which culture broadly is confused about what a person is and what sorts of things a person like. This is very vague. I'm happy to be more specific, but like I think there are a lot of fairly deep confusions about human nature in the discourse generally, and that it's a service to just patiently continue to correct them and be like no that's not how it is if you actually pay attention to your experience it actually looks like this and uh there's also a limit to how much of it is like discovering a thing that's true about human nature versus how much of it is more like supplying a different and better story than the prevailing stories like there are some prevailing narratives that are i think not only like you could say that they're inaccurate, but another way to say it is that they're disempowering. Like a person who believes this story, these kinds of stories is like trapped or stuck in various ways. And that there are more empowering stories that one could spread. Like here's a different story about what it is to be a person and what it is that we are to each other. And this story like frees you, this story like unsticks you, this story like shows you where to go, shows you like how to move through the world in a way that is dynamic and alive and exciting. That was all very abstract, but those are some words. Hmm. 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 Yeah, I don't have a concise answer to this question yet. Oh, concision is not yeah. a requirement. Okay, cool. Um, I think I'm... 
in general on the sh the show and having recorded conversations in particular and certainly really for conversations in general but especially for recorded conversations i never want to um talk about something that someone doesn't want to talk about like within the scope of the things that we both want to talk about i want to go like as deeply as possible and so um i understand not wanting to put words to some things that are hard to put words to or that feel like counterproductive to put words to and uh I am also, that's like where my curiosity is running. It's like, hmm, interesting. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's what's present for me right now. Gotcha. Yeah. Like I am, I did after saying those things go on to attempts to answer the question. So like, mm -hmm. I, I'm not opposed to talking about this, but I'm also just, I just wanted to say like, here is a thing that comes up for me when trying to talk about this. Like I could, I could say things about what I think I'm doing and what I think we're doing that are very grandiose. And I'm like, not sure those things are useful to say publicly. Mm. I will say more of those things privately to people just as a kind of like getting up to syncing with each other. But like, like I worry more about saying grandiose things publicly because I think it just kind of becomes like a, just another like target for spiritual materialism. I'm just like, well, what if we just didn't do that? <laughs> Um, what do you think if anything if anything is a useful thing to say publicly about this activity of harmonization and uh attuning to this other divine music and participating in that yeah i mean Like, I think we can all agree. I think that it's not a, con it wouldn't be controversial to say that like thing things out there and kind of the broader internet are kind of bad in a lot of ways. Like people are, you know, being like dunking and they're like engaging in like, you know, status games or whatever. And they're like engaging in pointless arguments that don't resolve anything where people are just like disagreeing about the meanings of words or whatever. And like, there's just a lot of like very, dumb and pointless things happening on the internet at large and like one way the sort of a simple way you could describe what teapot is trying to do is like hey what if the internet wasn't dumb and pointless <laughs> like what if it was good instead what if we like said things that were useful and cool and like interesting and what if we like tried to help each other and what if we like tried to transform each other's lives like sincerely tried to transform each other's lives uh, using words and arts and uh, whatever kind of Thing that is like that and like in order to do that like a thing that is very popular on the internet as large as criticism and criti there's a way in which criticism is not that difficult like all you have to do is like look at a thing and be like i don't like this thing <laughs> which is not hard because there are just many things that aren't very good out there you just got this thing kind of sucks and then you just like try to put some of that into words but here's why i think this thing kind of sucks and people are like yes criticism i love it and but like i think like the stuff that visa talks about around like focus your time and energy on what you want to see more of is like very powerful and very underappreciated around this like i think there's a way in which people like i think the criticism is mostly played out so, like i think there's very little alpha left in criticism in general like in sort of broad cultural like there's no i think there's no point like i could write a million substack posts that are just like criticism of things, of things that i think are bad and i think there's no i could do that and i find it i think it's pointless like uh like there's way too much criticism already everyone already knows that things suck you can read a million different people explaining in like granular detail how much everything sucks it's a very common form of writing on the internet and it's just like the problem is that like it doesn't give you any place to go like it's not like positive it doesn't give you a direction in which to move like when when the internet is Delu deluged with criticism like this all it does is like like it just traps people and it's kind of like okay this is bad and 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 it's you're just like everything just kind of like scrunches you up and reduces your range of motion and then you just kind of become paralyzed and it's sort of nothing like the the point of as i see it the point to focus your time and energy on what you want to see more of is to provide directions to move it's to provide like 
places for your energy to go and places for your attention to go. And when you talk about that stuff publicly, it provides places for other people's attention and energy to go. Like, where should we go? Like, what do we do? Where, like, what, like, where, yeah, just like, where does it all, where, where are we all going? And so like, in order to participate in this project, you have to, on some level, like, have some kind of faith in something like your own taste or your own judgments or your own discernments, like your your own ability to distinguish good from bad. And like, on some level, you have to be willing to be like, okay, like, I believe I, I have an opinion about which things are good and which things people should focus on and which things I should focus on and where I think our attention and energy should be. And then you go describe that stuff. You like express that stuff through words or you express it through art or you express it through music or like whatever, like everyone sort of has like a different medium or something in which their expression of like the nature of the good can flow the most easily. And like, I would very much like to just continually encourage people to do that more, just like more of that stuff, more of the stuff that really speaks to you, more of the like, here's like my vision of beauty and truth and goodness and whatever, like people are also going to use different words to describe the thing. Like some people will really, some people will really resonate with beauty. Some people will really resonate with love. Some people will really resonate with truth, just like that stuff, all the good stuff, the stuff that's good, the stuff that's good, <laughs> the good stuff, you know, <laughs> like, yeah like there's something there about just like res like articulating and 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 vibing out one's like vision of goodness and then continuing to refine that vision and like it taking in other people's the things that other people are doing other people are also making art other people are like one can be inspired by other people's stuff and then incorporate that inspiration into one's own vibes and then we can kind of, you know, just create like a beautiful little like scene of of vibes on the nature of goodness. And that all can kind of radiate outwards, I hope, into who knows what, into like who knows what other kinds of people are waiting to be to be inspired. Like like uh there are very few scenes, I think, on the internet that at least that I can see that have any kind of real hope. And so I think if we if we can cultivate any kind of real hope, that's like a huge advantage that we can have. And that's like an opportunity for us to offer something to other people that like that like that we have any at all just sources of hope. That's those are some words about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's really one of the roles I see you playing as almost like a steward of the vibes or the scene and uh it not like a like a steward of many like a a shepherd in a uh yeah. like there's lots of people doing the shepherding there's other people who do it it's not that's different than like a king you know that's trying to have the unity yeah. that you're talking about earlier it's just like mm -hmm. hey this seems good like I'll tend to these things or this over here and like this seems good let's have more of that and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cultivating like aliveness in expression and being like oh that was alive i saw you you did that yeah, that was great yeah, you yeah, know yeah, more yeah, of that yeah. please yeah yeah that's that's a lot of fun i enjoy doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah it's tricky stuff it's like it's just it's so easy for this kind of stuff to descend into nagging to be like, hey, I think you guys are doing bad stuff and you should do mm. different stuff from what you're doing. I'm like, mm, I don't like, yeah, one of one of sort of my philosophical positions or whatever is that I think nagging is almost always counterproductive. It's just like, mm. it just feels bad. No one wants to be nagged. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Not always, like sometimes there can be a kind of like challenge that I think could be healthy. Like sometimes you can, you can tell someone like, hey buddy, like you have the, you claim to have these values and you just like definitely aren't living up to them. Like that mm -hmm. can be a health, that can be healthy. I think like a, like a, a vibe check of like, Hey, you should like, have you tried living up to your own values? Like that's, I, I think that can be healthy, but kind of undirected complaining about stuff that's happening is I think probably mostly uh, worse than just 
trying to point people in the direction you want them to go. Like this is, I think, another aspect of focus on what you want to see more of is like, yeah, just just pointing the way forward. Just like, hey, more arts. Here's some, and, and, and for example, being like, here's some of my arts. And like, that can be, you can inspire people to make more art just by posting your own arts. Like you literally don't have to say anything. You don't have to be like, I think people should make more art. You can just post a bunch of arts. That's plenty. People will be like, hey, art, I could post art. And you don't have to say anything. You have to, you don't have to do any kind of negging. It's like, it's pretty good. Just more stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. One of the questions I asked you last time we talked was about how you understood the writing that you wanted to do. Like, I think you just started your Substack up and, you know, there's been maybe like five or six pieces that you've published in the last few months. And um, uh, one of the things I see you doing is uh, posting your writing and you're like, here's the live yeah. thing for me to write. I will write yeah. it. And then, and then that sort of has a knock on effect of like yeah. catalyzing it just the same way. Like people are like, Oh, yeah. I could write a really alive thing. That's different. And there's yeah. one of the things yeah, I yeah. see is like the genres that you're spanning are like, one very diverse, but also um, not. Um, there's a huge range. You know, it's like stories and like nonfiction and like explanations of things. But then they're like woven together in a really interesting mix. Like you, for example, you just launched a dating profile, and it's like, well, that's you know, that's a really different dating profile than like it. Does, yeah. You know, it doesn't say like how tall you are or like what hobbies you have or like you know. Yeah specifics about your hopes and dreams for a partner it's just like you're bearing your soul you know yeah, in a certain yeah, ways yeah. this is yeah, the yeah. thing to do um or uh you know other pieces that you've written where it's just like weaves in and out of a bunch of different genres and um i wonder if at this vantage point in you know it's may of 2023 we last talked on record uh in march of 2022 like how you oh. currently understand your writing and what that what what the larger project is and in fact in fact mm -hmm. i'll just add one more part to that question which is sure. you've said this a few ways over the years but you said um you said recently it, this was in the the um the wizard thread was the practice is you just keep writing and writing until you break your own heart that's the practice that's the entire practice you can dress up in a lot of other words but that's the pivot of and when i read that now right now like i'm like yes and because yes, and yeah there's more there's more there's more like you yeah. are clearly writing until you break your own heart i get that that is well said thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. very helpful <laughs> and yeah i think that's like that that's i talked earlier about there's like the u level there's other individuals and then there's like the group and i'm like that's what you're doing on the u level but what yeah. are you doing on the uh, other levels yeah. you know with your writing yeah. anyway Take that yeah. where you will. But. That's a great, this is great. This is a wonderful question. Thank you very much for this spectacular question. I'm just like, mm. I'm like in looking forward to answering it. <laughs> it's just nice. Like, mm, this is going to be, this is going to be good. With the writing, with the writing, like, it was important to me that I didn't feel I, I, I tried naming the Substack in a way such that I would feel as unconstrained as possible by topic or format. Like I didn't want to promise anything in particular. I didn't want to be like, this is going to be a place where I write, like I, where I like talk about emotional processing, or this is a place where I write poetry or whatever. Like, and I actually, I draw inspiration here from, you know, the, the great blogger, Scott, Aaron, Scott, you know, Alexander, who like I think exemplified this delightful mix and on such like, codex of like here is some here is like a big thing about medicine here's like a big thing about politics here's like a short story that I wrote here's like like he just starts he just writes about whatever he wants and it's like radically successful right like one of the greatest blogs of all time and that was that was I I may have occasionally some personal bones to pick with specific things that Scott says but I think the the thing that he has done with Slate Star Codex and Astro Codex 10 was like incredibly inspirational it was like wow it's like this is like a way that a person can be on the internet and like I I think he does an excellent job with his body of work broadly of like of of like like how to say it like like he he just like he allows all of his interests to just show up like just he just talks about whatever on some level I think he he maybe feels more of a sense of responsibility now than he used to but certainly if you go back to his earlier writing like like you know I would I I I like read his live journal archives I don't know how many people not even know about his live journal but he's that his live journal was like his first blog that I know of 
and he just writes about whatever he wants. He's just like constantly writing about whatever he wants. And it's great. And I'm like, wow, this is like fucking sick. I also could just write about whatever I want. That would be like very cool. And so the Substack on some level is an experiment. And like, what if I wrote about whatever I wanted, however I wanted. And like, I, I, I wanted to do it be- in large part because I was starting to feel constrained by Twitter as a format. Like I really love and appreciate Twitter as a format. And I think I've benefited a lot as a writer from trying to write good tweets and good threads. And like, I think that the Twitter, the ideal style to me of writing on Twitter involves putting one thought per tweet and it's to make them easier to retweet and quote tweet. And that's important. And it constrains me when I just have thoughts that take more than one tweet to express. And so the, the sort of the one one of the several motivations for me for getting back into long form, I used to write slightly more long form on like Facebook and stuff. Uh, and I had a previous blog, but I wanted to start expressing thoughts that were long, just that I just had long thoughts. And I was like, I can't express these thoughts on Twitter um, or like long sequences of thoughts that was just like this, it's like, if I tried to put this in a thread, it would just be like too scattered. I need to be able to like write five consecutive paragraphs describing this thing so that I can like each paragraph can like build on the next one and then we can like go somewhere. Um, I also wanted to not exactly write poetry, but write like more poetic prose in a way that I felt like there wasn't always room for on Twitter. Like just writing really evocative stuff. Like I think the first the first post um, five tips for how to have great conversations that I wrote after Vlad Kemp. I think that was like a good example of a kind of thing I wanted to do, which is to write very evocative things, just stuff that really transports the reader into an experience. I just I wanted to do a lot of that stuff. Uh, in part, uh, there's really a lot I could say about this. Uh, Like I write because I want my writing to have an impact on other people, right? So the Substack is on some level an experiment in different ways of impacting people. It's like, okay, I could impact somebody by writing a story about my own life. I could impact somebody by writing a short story that is that is sort of reflects themes in my own life, but better not is not directly about my own life. I could write, I could impact somebody by writing, uh, like the date me page is 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 partly a date me. Pa- is sort of a date me page and it's sort of a commentary on other date me pages like i don't make this explicit in the text at all but like in in that in in that piece i never describe any positive quality of mine i never say like people i actually haven't read very many date me pages but this is just based on like dating profiles but people will write things like i am friendly and i'm curious and whatever and it's like that doesn't mean anything like literally anyone can say that <laughs> Like there's, there's a whole like talk is cheap thing that I don't feel like people have internalized when it comes to writing dating profiles. And like the, there was a sort of philosophical stance I was taking with that piece, which was like, I am going to attempt to show rather than tell the reader about my qualities as a person. Like I wanted to communicate something about, uh, about my soul, but I didn't want to just say like, here are the characteristics that my soul has. Like, that's not how you tell someone that's not how you show someone your soul. You do it by showing them. Like I I was trying to point towards this possibility to see the dating page itself as a genre of art rather than as like a as like a letter, like a rather than as like a, I don't know how to describe the other thing, like a like a technical i don't know like just the, the kinds of like the, an advertisement the, in the like an advertisement or something like people were just like here are my qualities and here's here are my hobbies and here's what i'm looking for in a partner and just like Ugh, i don't want to do this like i'm sure it's fine for, I'm, if it works for other people then like i don't want to like this is why i didn't want to write it as a criticism like it's not written as a criticism but it contains an implicit criticism um be, by showing this other direction i'm like here's another direction a completely different direction these these pages could have gone this whole time and like, 
I would prefer to have done it that way because I don't want to like the, the people who wrote the daily pages that I'm criticizing are friends of mine. And like, I don't want to actually, I don't want to make them feel bad, mm -hmm. but I did want. There's to enough like, of that. <laughs> Every time exactly. people post them, someone's like, <laughs> this someone's person, like, this how dare they say the what they want? Like, well, and tell yeah, people, I, Fuck yeah, that. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to pile. I certainly don't want to pile on to that discourse, but I did want to like indicate where I saw potential. I was like, guys, there's such richness in this. You can like, like someone once told me, I was like trying to fill out my OkCupid okay profile or something. And someone once told me like, you know, you don't have to actually answer any of the questions on that page. Like literally it's just six text boxes and you can put whatever you want in them. Like there's something there about the freedom. There's so much freedom that people have in language that they don't understand that they have. And so one of the things that I guess I'm trying to demonstrate through my writing is I'm trying to demonstrate something about the freedom that's possible in language. Like there's just things you can do in language that people don't even try to do. Uh, and I hope that, that I can I can show people through example, like here are some of the freedoms that you have in language. You can do this and you can do this and you can do this. And like, it's all just fine. Like Sonia has an old tweet that's something like, wow, you can just type whatever you want in this little box. I was like, yeah, exactly. You can just type whatever you want in that little box. Like, you can just say anything. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. there's just, there's so, there's so much freedom in language. Um, that's like one kind of thread that I feel like runs through my Substack writing is something about the freedom of language. And there's a bunch of other stuff. There's just like a lot of things I want to explore. Um, I have several drafts in the works that I hope to be able to get to sooner or later. I've been distracted away from them, but I hope to be able to get back to them. And I am looking forward to partly like I don't, partly I think I'm still discovering what I really want to write about because there's just a lot of stuff. And I just think there's so much, there's so many like really good pieces that haven't been written yet, you know? And I'm just looking forward to trying to write some of those. As you speak about this, um, there's some clarity coming to me about, you know, I talked about these like three levels of what I see you trying to do. And it's like on the personal level, you're trying to break your own heart. And on the other level, like to one person, you're like trying to break their heart. And then on the collective level, you are trying to break the concept of language and words and <laughs> the box that people have put themselves in of what's possible mm -hmm. to say in words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate for you? Yeah, that's definitely one of the things. I feel like there's other things. Mm -hmm. Like the sort of, there's a flip side of breaking your own heart, which is something like setting your own heart on fire. Mm -hmm. And so there's also a like- What's different about that? Uh, it's warmer. <laughs> ah, I see. Yeah, yeah fair. <laughs> yeah, there's like, and I feel like they're they're kind of, on some level, the same thing. Like there is just some kind of a, like getting in touch with your heart. And then like when you, sometimes when you do that, you're like, oh, I'm, it's, it's, there's so much grief here. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the thing. And then sometimes you're like, oh, there's so much like aliveness here. Or there's so much like, fire. yes, and there's just sometimes different things in, in one's heart. Yes. And, uh, and so I think when like, yeah, sometimes you try to get someone in touch with their heart and the result is a lot of heartbreak because there's just is a lot of heartbreak there. And that's, what's there. And sometimes you try to get someone in touch with their heart and then it's like, there's so much fire there that maybe there's fire there that they haven't felt permission to express. Um, this is a big thing I feel like I got out of talking to Crystal also. Crystal just like, I don't really understand exactly how she did this, but somehow she like demonstrated to me what it was like to sort of have a burning heart all the time and I was like whoa that's a thing I could just do like there's and it, it helped me understand like ah there's like a lot of intensity in here that I have been uh suppressing because I thought it was bad and harmful and talking to Crystal helped me like reconceptualize that it's like what if that's actually the best part <laughs> Like, what if that's the part that, like, is, can inspire other people? And mm. what if it can be a powerful force for good? And that was, like, a big shift. And ever since, yeah, like, since that shift, I've been holding back less and less in my writing, which I think has been very good. And people are, like, clearly responding to it more strongly now. And that's exciting. And I'm just like, yes, there's more where this came from. Like, I, there's just more stuff. Like, I'm I'm just excited to discover what else is there by doing it. Yes. Hmm. You said um, 
earlier that there's more there and part of it is you know like uh, finding fire in your heart or creating fire in your heart or mm -hmm. setting your heart on fire um and is there any other, anything else that you feel like you're striving to do mm, i had a i had a thought just now which is sort of related to this mm -hmm. like a lot of the broader discourse around language models and stuff is this kind of despair of like oh the ai will take over you know everyone's jobs and mm -hmm. you know people won't be able to write for a living or whatever and i gotta say that i am still not even remotely worried about this and like for me personally and in fact i take it as a challenge which is something like uh like I still think, and I think this will probably become less true over time, but for now, I still think that the the kinds of the kind of language that language models produce is still almost entirely bullshit. Um, and so it's good at replacing human tasks that are mostly about producing bullshit, like you know, writing ad copy or whatever. And there's and so it's a challenge to it feels I'm taking it as a challenge to me as a writer, which is like, how can I write things that are as unbullshit as possible? Like what's sort of the, mm. the exact opposite of bullshit and how do I get there? Uh, like how do I write things that like an LLM couldn't possibly have written? Uh, like, and that, that, I think that's a very interesting challenge of just like, how do I, uh, like I could say it as how do I sound as human as possible, but that that already is a little, that like, it's something like how do I demonstrate humanity through writing or something? Like how do you, how do you, how do you write stuff that like really, is just like oh man like a person wrote this mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll, also also there's an interesting kind of thing there which i haven't really thought much about of just like all of that writing ends up being like a, a vote for how the next generation of lrms is i i have no idea how the next generation will be, be trained uh because they somehow need to be able to exclude l and generated public from their training data i think or else it'll just be a disaster but like the next generation of llms will be trained on newer text on the internet and so like from this point on we're sort of all aware that the thing or we could we could be aware that the things that we write on the internet from this point on are all like votes for how the llm should be and mm. that was always true we just didn't know it like everything that we've ever written on the internet, this is a thing that's the point that Scott makes um, towards the end of, of one of his recent pieces. Like everything we've ever written on the internet was a vote for how the LLM sh should be. And everything that we write on the internet from now on is a vote for how the LLM should be. And like that's a that carries with it a certain kind of responsibility. And uh, that's another kind of aspect. I, this is not something I really talked about, but this is like a thread that's kind of running somewhere in the back of my mind of like, uh, yeah, the LLMs, as a, LLMs as a phenomenon are like challenging us in some way to understand the humanness of language and to get back in touch with the humanness of language. Hmm. Hmm. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. I'm reminded of another one of your tweets that maybe was more about verbal conversations, but I feel like it's the same riff either in, in writing or in verbal conversations, but you said, um, yeah, this was just recently, about a week ago, you said, I've been enjoying spicing up all my conversations by relentlessly following the thread of aliveness, discovering what makes both of us light up and going there and then telling mm -hmm. the other person where they came most alive. And um, seems like that's part of what you're saying you're doing with your writing. It's just like, yeah, relentlessly following the thread of aliveness or yeah. as you were just saying, humanity. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I have a question about that, which is, what's the question? Say more about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you've ever had, this is sort of for the audience if you've ever had just like a conversation at a party or on a date that was just kind of flat and met, like it's not that hard to have like a pretty okay conversation but that's kind of flat you like 
kind of say some stuff that you kind of think or you kind of care about or you sort of stick to safe topics and you express safe opinions on those topics or whatever like there's a lot of ways to have safe okay boring conversations and like uh i'm not i'm not saying like this is different from a critique of small talk like i think small talk is distinct as a phenomenon but there's something about like the difference between having a conversation where you sort of stay in safe territory the whole time versus having a conversation where you like take some interpersonal risks like you ask people about uncomfortable things or you reveal uncomfortable things like uh when that works and it doesn't always work for many reasons but when that works like you can enter you know these are things that you can experience in circling or authentic relating or other kinds of spaces where people experiment with having unusual conversations like you can enter like much more interesting conversation spaces where you're like oh my god now we're like actually talking to each other we're like actually having an encounter as opposed to kind of just like letting our chat bots kind of talk to each other like now we are talking to each other which is a quite different experience. really different yeah and like when you've had that experience you're just like wow this is like fucking great this is like so much better than the other shit which is mm -hmm. awful and i think there's some, something about LLMs like makes that contrast even more stark. Like you now, now you can like now it's a real question when you see some text on the internet. You're like, like, was this generated by an algorithm? Like it's a live question now because there are people who are, you know, abdicating their responsibility for talking to algorithms. And those people, like, there's just different things that happen when you do. Like, there's people on Stack Exchange who are trying to answer, like trying to answer people's math questions by putting them in chat GPT and it doesn't work. Chat GPT is very bad at answering math questions so far. Um, but it's just funny that people are trying. It's just like, hmm. come on, man, what are you doing? Like something something about that like really puts the starkness of the the difference between having like a a sort of boring surface like conversation with with sort of like where you're not really neither of you is really in the conversation with the conversation where like you're really in the conversation like I don't know. Some people might only have conversations like this in intimate relationships or friendships. And some people might never have conversations like this. I don't know. Like, but the difference is huge. And I think once you've tasted the real thing, you're just like, oh my God, this is like fucking great. Like you can leave conversations feeling like inspired and understood and like grateful and like touched and moved. Like there are just so many like like a really good conversation can be like really good sex. And I say this as a person who has never had really good sex. I'm like extrapolating, <laughs> but there's a there's a there's like a a, com a coming together to create something in the conversation that's new, and um, so that is a kind of experience that a person can have, and is an experience that I can have. And on the one hand, I endeavor to try to make conversations like this, and I've tried various ways of doing that like in circling there's a style of doing this where you're just like constantly challenging people to reveal things that they're feeling or whatever and that could work it could be very powerful to just like have an experience where you know like a bunch of different people in a circle reveal that they're all angry or something and then you're just like wow I, I, I thought it was just me but it turns out other people are also angry or whatever like that could be powerful but it's like circling is a container specifically designed for stuff like that to happen and everyone who agrees to enter a circle kind of knows what they're setting up for and there was a period where i kind of tried to import that in, into my regular conversations which kind of went weird it's like a weird thing to try to do in a normal conversation like it just ends up being like you just you're trying to like force people into intimacy before they've agreed or are ready for it and it's just like i had to learn that it, it took me a while to learn that i was like ah that's like actually not good <laughs> Mm -hmm. people don't like that for a good reason and so there's been kind of a question that i've had of like how 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 do you like make conversations more interesting without a container of any kind like if you're just having a normal conversation with a person how do you like move that conversation in the direction of more interesting or interesting is not quite the right word but like more more engaging or more alive or something and and so that tweet describes like a thing that I've been playing with. It was like, ah, like in any conversation, I could just start following the thread of aliveness. Like instead of kind of engaging our conversation sort of robotically, like I think people can kind of get stuck in like, oh, like 
they asked me a question so now i have to respond with an answer to that question like oh they like said a thing so now i have to like respond with like my opinion on the thing that they express an opinion on but you can actually just do other stuff you can just be like like visa's talked about stuff like this you can be like oh hey i noticed that your like face did a funny thing when you said that and now i'm curious about that or like oh hey like you seem really excited about this topic so now i'm going to engage you more on this topic or like oh hey you see like now i'm like very curious about uh like the thing the thing that you just said reminds me of this thing that i'm really curious about so now i'm going to bring my curiosity in and like there's there's just a lot of there's a lot of like aliveness things like that that are just much easier to do with no container like you don't have to you don't have to poke at people's feelings it's just actually unnecessary <laughs> um i do like pointing out things about people's faces that's like a lot of fun when people when i'm when i i enjoy pointing out like oh hey you're like your your face seemed really sad for a second which is different from tell me how you're feeling right now it's just an observation it's just like hey your face seemed really sad for a second and like we don't have to talk about that if you don't want to but like <laughs> now i'm curious or whatever like the, the other person gets an opportunity to follow up on that or not. And I think either way, uh, I think most people appreciate uh, being seen in that small way. It's just like, oh, wow, you like noticed that I seem sad. That's like kind of cool. Um, like that's a sort of gift that you can offer people without needing to also be like, tell me how you're feeling. <laughs> Yeah, so I've been really enjoying the aliveness thing. And then there's kind of a corresponding thing you can do in writing. And this one, I feel like I have less good words for explaining other than like, you can follow the thread of aliveness in writing. You can just like write things that feel alive instead of dead. Uh, where dead writing is like ad copy or like, you know, like shitty growth hacking emails or whatever stuff that is like, oh, here's how to 10x your engagement on Twitter or whatever. Like just fucking no, just like like stuff that treats you and other people as machines and, and you know like machines like optimizing mindlessly for numbers. It's like, okay, what if not that though? Um yeah, and instead stuff that like makes people feel more alive in some way after having read it like there's just a whole bunch of stuff that you can do in that direction and i think that insofar as i have any kind of skill in doing that it builds on like my own emotional practice like this this thing of like right until you break your own heart builds on stuff i learned doing biomotive which is like talk until you break your own heart rough if you wanted to summarize it like very very briefly um, so i just like there's a specific kind of style of language you can be attuned to in biomotive that like this is how you talk in a way that breaks your own heart there's like there's like a thing the thing that, that i think doug calls it emotion doug Tatarin, the guy the creative guy I think he calls it emotional language. He's like, mm. emotional language is simple because the emotional brain is simple. It doesn't understand things like, oh, well, I've always had a history of bad interactions with my mother and she's never been very accommodating of my needs. Like, those words are too long, too big, too complicated. That's not how the emotional brain talks. The way the emotional brain talks is like, she wasn't there for me when I needed her. That's how the emotional brain talks. And you can learn to talk that way to yourself and then you can learn to bring not exactly that energy but you can like that kind of direction in language the kind of language that is just like direct and that hits you uh like once you've learned how to hit yourself in language you can learn how to hit other people in language i guess that, that's kind of how i would say it. Hmm. Yeah. that's fascinating because what Obviously, I've done a lot of biomotive. I know what you mean about the emotional heart being very simple. It's very simple words. I'm angry. I'm sad. You know, there's you either feel it or you don't. Uh, whatever words end up resonating for you. And then it's like, oh, that's what resonance feels like. And then yeah. if I juxtapose that experience of honoring my own heart and speaking to it, speaking for it, of it, with what you write, like how do you what <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're not the same they're not the yeah. same the, the, they're 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 not the thing you were talking about of like oh my mother history whatever but 
yeah. The the the, the, you're, the, the things yeah. you're writing are extremely complicated and intricate. Yeah, and not, like yeah, that's right. And yeah. that they have this aliveness and this heartfeltness and what what is that? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I yeah, like I don't. This is very fresh territory for me. Like I haven't really been thinking i haven't been like thinking explicitly about this like it's been kind of in the back of my mind so i i am going to have to generate words to talk about this live because i i i i don't have anything cached about this but i'm very curious i'm very interested in this question there is a like uh so i wrote in one of these Substack posts re-encountering language about this experience i had where i felt like like I had some kind of big emotional shift around like, oh, I can just do whatever I want and feeling like hypomanic. And one of the things that happened, oh, excuse me, is that I started wanting to write poetry just spontaneously. And I not, I don't, it's not like I never want, I had never wanted to do that, but I hadn't wanted to do that since I was 13, I think. Like, so it had literally been like 14 years since I had wanted to write poetry now she's like I want to write poetry now and then the poetry that came out was just like bizarre like stuff that I didn't understand stuff that was like like I quote some of it in the in the post like there was something that I was trying desperately to do I was like trying to write stuff that was like as meaningful as I could or like as as like beautiful as I could or, like as like sacred as I could or something like that there was a specific direction I was trying to go in linguistic space and I was trying to go there as hard as possible and I didn't understand it but it just kept happening so I was like okay I guess this is what we're doing now and um that link that direction is similar to but not the same as the biomotive direction right? like the, the biomotive like the simple emotional language is simple as you say and then there is a more complex thing that has to do with like that is more like writing poetry like I haven't written very much poetry and I haven't written poetry lately but I think that the way that I write prose is very heavily informed by the way that I write poetry it's like like I try to write sentences that feel like something maybe that's one way to say it like the sentence should feel it should feel like something to read the sentence and uh that feeling isn't necessarily an emotion as such like the things that are being expressed are more complicated than like sadness or anger or whatever like they're more like sort of mood landscapes or like more like felt senses in the general focusing sense right so uh biomotive itself is an offshoot of general focusing and general focusing was kind of my first practice the kind of first time that anyone had sat me down and be like, what if you tried to name what you were feeling right now? And like, like felt senses are much, much broader than emotions. Like felt senses can be like a whole like murky, like globs of meaning and narrative and like, like they can be very very broad felt senses can be like you're working on a scientific problem and you have like some hunch about what the solution looks like you're like mm, the solution it kind of feels like this i can't quite most of it i can't put it into words yet but i have like a murky a murky like thing that coalescing inside of me that's built out of like other murky things that i have inside of me and it's like and then you like keep working on the problem and one day you're like ah okay this is the structure it's like this and the thing that was happening, but like, but there was already something in you that was coalescing before that moment. Before the moment that it was clear enough to write down, there was something else that was not clear enough to write down. There was something pre-verbal that was trying to make itself verbal, but before it was verbal, it was some other thing. So, like a more accurate description of what I try to do in my writing is like I am constantly trying to evoke felt senses. Like everything that I write is an attempt to evoke focusing, to evoke felt, to label felt senses in some sense, and that kind of writing is very different from trying to, for example, lay out a logical argument. Like, I don't think anything I've written in the Substack is a logical argument yet. Um, I, for various reasons, don't believe in logical argument. I mean, except in like very specific situations or something, but like, like, like I'm not trying to convince someone of anything they don't already believe or something, but what I am trying to do is like, like I have written enough and gotten enough feedback on my writing at this point to know that like there are many inarticulate, there are many like 
things that other people, other people have all these felt senses inside of them. They have feelings and they have experiences that they're trying to digest. And other people have all this stuff that hasn't been articulated. And sometimes I know that I can say things to other people that helps them label a felt sense that they have. And, it's ha- and then a thing will suddenly stop in the place of like, oh, shit, fuck. Like that's that's the experience that I look for. That's the kind of experience that I'm trying to create in readers is this sense of like something unnamed and them suddenly becoming named. So yeah, so that's like that's like a more accurate description. It's like I am sort of constantly trying to label felt senses and to evoke felt senses in the reader. And uh, it's a lot more fun than the other kind of than other kinds of writing in my mm-hmm. experience. Like this is the kind of writing that can like change people. Like people can read it and then afterwards be like, oh, I'm, I'm like a little different now. Like mm-hmm. I'm like, well, this is kind of like why even write anything else? <laughs> mm-hmm. If you can write this, like you might as well just do it all the totally. time. Totally. Yeah. That's very helpful. That's, I think that's exactly what the difference is. And uh, it's reminding me of some clarity I have about my own writing practice and also my art practice. And that there's a lot that I write that, especially tweets, but also blog posts that are trying to convey specific ideas or also specific felt senses, but like with a, with a precision, it often feels like a tweet comes to me and it's like, Ah, uh, this thing wants to be said, and um, there's there's a focus there on precision and and really conveying an idea yeah. from that felt sense. Yeah. But then there's a whole different genre that I've been exploring with both writing and art of, yeah, what you said about evoking, and in particular, there's a lot of things that I um, would not let myself say baldly uh, in words because yeah. of my own constraints about right speech, basically. Mm. Um, you know, I, maybe I'm violating my own boundaries or like privacy concerns or something like that. And it's like, right. it's mm-hmm. not, it's not appropriate. It's not ethical to my own standards to say certain things, mm. but I can say them in fiction or in art in a way right. that evokes the sense I would like to convey and be seen in without mm. violating any particulars. And like, I do this a lot with my art, certainly. Uh, visual art and then like I recently wrote this story of um, a tale of two boxes which is like a weird weird little story that like it's like what just happened but it's like oh there's this very specific feeling I was conveying about a very specific situation and it's like in there it's like you don't know what the situation is you have no idea what it's about you know nothing about my life from that story but like the felt sense is evoked Mm -hmm. I did it I fucking did it you know yeah 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 and like i think like maybe a real artist would just this this would be obvious to like a real artist but i think this is actually just like where a lot of if not most art comes from which is people trying to evoke things about their own lives and like with sort of as many layers of indirection as necessary for various reasons like there could be there are so there are all sorts of reasons why you might like not feel like you can or want to talk directly about like painful experiences in your life for example but there's so many that like there's literally a set, multiple tv tropes pages that are just lists of like here's a thing that was happening in this writer's life and then here's how it manifested in whoa the i want to see that tv tropes page yeah, yeah one of the pages is called creator breakdown it's really mm. good there's a whole section that's just about eminem and eminem is kind of a special case because he's very very like direct about it he's just like i fucking hate my ex-wife or whatever mm. it's like okay i get it you fucking hate your ex-wife like makes sense uh but you know there's a lot of examples that are much less direct um there's 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 a whole sub category that's kind of like a guy who writes like a comic like his wife breaks up with him and then in the next in the next issue of the comic he kills all the characters off whoa <laughs> it's whoa. really funny wow. that kind of thing happens a lot it's just like i'm pissed i'm just gonna kill all the characters off because i'm so pissed huh. And like that kind of thing is just happening all the time, probably. Like people are just kind of like you could I I like you could say that maybe they're if you sort of took a psychological perspective, it's like you could say that they're using their like their like pains and their heartbreaks. Uh, or sorry, you could say that they're using art as a form of therapy, but like you can maybe also twist it around and say, like, this is just sort of what art is for. And like Maybe therapy is a kind of, this is a thing that James Hellman, I think, said. I saw someone post a, a quote around this, like, 
like maybe this is just what art is for and it has been what art is for this whole time and like maybe therapy is is almost a like a, a redirection of that natural artistic energy away from art towards something that is like well, i don't know that i agree with this but this is a thing that he said and it's an interesting it's interesting for, for thought i personally am not worried about like you know there's this idea that like artists need to suffer or be in pain to make great art and i think this kind of stuff is sort of pointing towards it like i think a lot of great art is made out of sort of wrestling with pain and heartbreak but i don't think it has to be like that and like also, I'm I'm not personally worried about like running out of inspiration. Like I don't worry about I'm not like, oh, if I process too much many feelings, I won't have, be able to make art. And like I'm not worried about that. Because like there's sort of in some way, I believe it's kind of impossible to run out of inspiration. Like there's just always more stuff. Like once you've done, you know, you can finish hypothetically, it, even if you somehow hypothetically finish processing all of your own personal stuff, like you're still in a web of other people you have friends that you care about you have compassion for other other people's suffering and that can become the the next thing that inspires you to make like you can just keep if if you ever i don't, I don't think people ever feel this way but hypothetically if, even if you ever felt complete you could just like keep expanding your own circle of compassion until you like encounter a new thing um so i don't think it's really possible to run out of material for art in that sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm those some words hmm. Hmm. yeah it's sort of a lot of these things are like sort of obvious once you find them but i think i had to find them for myself in my own path. i mean i didn't know i was going to make visual art for example i started that a couple years ago yeah. and like i don't know i used to really 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 want to write fiction when i was a teenager and then i just like totally set that aside for more than a decade and then it came back last year and I was like, okay, I guess we're yeah, writing fiction yeah. now. And yeah, 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 yeah. So, mm -hmm. but you know, I've had, I guess what I'm, it's almost felt like reparenting in a way of like, oh, I'm reparenting this prior aspiration I used to have, this like connection to writing and art mm -hmm. and drawing. I mean, certainly I doodled a yeah. little bit when I was a kid, you know, and yeah, I yeah, set that aside yeah. for a long time. So it's like, anyway, yeah. I guess it, it, it of course, I guess what I'm trying to say is, of course, it's probably obvious to a lot of people like, oh, art is about expressing yourself and like convey evoking <laughs> felt senses of what it's like to be you. It's like, well, so, yeah. you know, you can just hear the does around the world, but it's like, oh, no, nope, yeah. that's I set that aside for a long time. So, yeah, yeah. It's like I didn't I didn't go to art school. I didn't like hang out with other artists. So totally. like, stuff that is probably obvious to them is super not obvious to me about like the nature of arts. I hear there are books, though. There's this there's that book. What is it? The Artist's Way. Mm. Oh, some good material in it. Mm -hmm. Some good stuff in there. Mm -hmm. People seem to like that book. <laughs> so like, there's there's stuff to learn about about art. Mm -hmm. I think I'm trying to remember who said this. Somebody on Twitter. I think his name is Simon Oler. He said something like he described people a lot of people in Teapot as late onset artists. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, that's like. There's some stuff there it's like late onset artists you know like like people who sort of had had some kind of artistic inclination or some kind of artistic yearning that kind of got had derailed for a long time and now it's like oh what if i wanted to make art this whole time totally like, a little bit like, that. like yeah i'm i'm you know i'm remembering like i had all these artistic inclinations when i was 13 and then i set most of them aside um I'm like, what if I just fucking did all that stuff I wanted to do when I was 13? Like, I wanted to write stories. I wanted to write poems. I wanted I wanted to make video games. That's one I haven't gotten back to. It seems mm. hard. Mm. It seems like it would take a lot of effort mm. and time that I don't have. But one day, like, it would be cool to make at least one video game ever. That would be pretty sick. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Mm. Yeah. And now you're thinking, are you thinking about it now? <laughs> well, I'm thinking of my friend, uh, Ben, who makes video games. I'm like, to me, it's obvious that like just from a strategic person perspective you have to uh to make a video game not that you have to but like it it's 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 pragmatic to work with other people to make video games uh, right yeah 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 uh it's sufficiently complicated that it behooves you to collaborate with a team that is well coordinated and so anyway he he came to mind but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. nice yeah that's cool mm.
Well, what feels alive for you at this point in this conversation? Is there anything that you'd like to talk more about or ask or dive into? Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed getting to articulate all this stuff about language and writing. That was that was cool because this this is like yeah, this is like stuff that's just been kind of sitting in the back of my mind, like I said, but that I haven't really gotten a chance to talk about. So that was like I'm just noticing that it felt quite nice to get to mm -hmm. try to say some stuff about that. So if you had like more more questions or thoughts about language and writing and expression, I'm still happy to like, yeah, language, writing, expression, mm -hmm. art. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm like, I'm enjoying this topic. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me want to sense into what... I would like to do with my own writing mm. and I like have a very clear felt sense of it, but haven't articulated it yet. I mean, some things like I think of a lot of what I do now is playing like many games in parallel. And some of the writing games are like very clear to me, which game I'm playing. And like, for example, for a long time, I've written informational blog posts, as I call them. It's like, that's pretty clear. Mm. Like there's something I found valuable. I would like to explain it in a way that's useful for people that they can learn the thing too. Or right. I, I talked earlier about like the various tweets that come to me of like, I don't know, I guess I think of that one as like kind of like wisdom posting. It's like, oh, there's some insight or wisdom I would like to express clearly, usefully, beautifully, mm -hmm. like persuasively and like in the best words that I can. That one's clear. And then like with, I guess you'd say more creative writing, it's like, I'm not, I don't think I've articulated to myself what I want to do. And it would be fun to like put that into the conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, I think so for a time I made a commitment to myself that I have since broken very vigorously, which is, <laughs> uh, which um, was, I committed to myself that I would never watch movies again, uh, which oh. Uh, and then I and I started watching watching movies again, and it was because I was worried. Like there was a period where I was like watching at least one movie every day, and sometimes it was like three or four movies in a day. Or just like watching a lot of movies. And I was like, Tasha, I think you've watched enough movies for this lifetime. Uh, uh, and then my soul was like, No, you have not watched enough movies. Actually, still. Uh, and like, if you look at it from an addiction frame, it's like, Oh, yep, addicted. Like done. But mm. um. I think it's been much more useful and fruitful and true to look at it as like a, oh, my, the soul needs stories. The soul needs stories and like novels and films. And like, and then like, it starts to be dissatisfying to just consume other people's stories. And it's like, no, there are stories in here that want to be written. And the stories that you yeah. like from other people are like signals of the kind of story that wants to be written from you. And so yeah. I want to get yeah. like, functionally good enough to like i think yeah i want to write at least one book at all times and i want to write um at least one novel a year for a while like mm. i know that's the ambition and like Whoa. i want to be able to i basically imagine that i'll write like several like novels that i think are good but are just like decent they're not like amazing and then like if there's like a freaking amazing novel in my soul that wants to come out in this lifetime, I want to like have the skills to be able to write a story that like very specifically speaks to my soul and it's, mm -hmm. it's like gestalts and meaning that like, like the, I'm not ready to write a, a novel like that today. I don't think I'll be ready this year, probably not next year, probably not the year after that, probably not even this decade. But like, if I keep going, <laughs> like, I feel like there's, stories that want to come out that I have to be like ready to have them come out. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It reminds me that like, I think this March was maybe the first time I can remember that I looked forward to getting older. Mm -hmm. Because I like saw, I saw my, I like, I was able to kind of see myself as a person who was developing like skills and a abilities that I wanted and I was like oh my god in 10 years I'm going to be so much better than all this stuff that's going to be sick that's yeah like fucking crazy. and then another 10 years after that like fuck whoa. My god, I just can't even, like whoa like what what kind of stuff will I get up to 
after 10 years of defining this thing like totally that was a very new experience like before i had i had kind of been like no i want to stay the same age forever and never change <laughs> and now i'm like yeah i want to keep going this is gonna be <laughs> sick it's gonna be so awesome uh-huh yeah yeah so I, i'm curious hearing hearing this like oh, I want to like keep writing novels and then and then like, perhaps there will be like a fucking amazing novel that comes out. Like, I'm curious if you run into this phenomenon of like having an idea and then being like for something to write and then being like, I'm like not good enough as a writer to write this yet. And so maybe I should like, I should like save this idea for later. Hmm. Hmm. I don't, think so exactly i really have mm. such and maybe this relates to like vows and stuff like that but just such a vigorous practice of acting on every idea that comes to me just like as soon mm. as possible like even to the point that it's like a it's a flaw of like i'll rush you know i'm a rusher uh mm. but like i haven't every idea that's come to me for like years i've just acted on to the best of my ability at that time where like mm -hmm. i've written a lot of blog posts or like done a lot of service projects or like i don't know what there's all kinds of ideas that have come to me and then i act on them and mm -hmm. um i suspect that if i like did more imaginal work or like imagination stuff or world building or like fantasizing or daydreaming that there would be a lot more ideas than I could possibly write, but like, how is it? I mean, in some ways, just the imagining is like already scratching that itch um, because it's it, to me, subjectively, it's almost like, and this is just a way of seeing, but I put on the way of seeing that like by imagining that world, it is real. Um, and like it exists in the multiverse uh, and I'm like seeing it rather than like, fabricating it or something um and it's been like that sometimes but anyway um yeah I don't know I think I just really try to write the things that I can and I think there are specific skills that I feel like I don't have right now that I would like to learn how to do but I'll like try to the best of my ability and um mm. like I see I see various like for example I've noticed that I really like for whatever reason I really like mysteries and like crime stories and like heists and stuff uh which is, you know, I don't steal stuff. I don't kill people, but like, <laughs> but, and I, I don't think that's actually it. like a, a simple, I'm, it's always been confusing. Why do I like these so much? And a simple model would be like, oh, you just, some part of your soul really wants to do those things. And it's like, that's, that's not true. <laughs> I'm that just, I just, yeah. I'm, I'm me. And I'm like, nope, that's not it. I'm not interested. Yeah. Um, but I think it's partly, I think it's partly that there's really interesting character development in those stories. Um, like a heist mm -hmm. is almost like an excuse to like develop a bunch, like six or seven or eight, like fascinating characters and how they interact, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. But also there's something about like the intricacy of, in particular, like heists or like mysteries of like, there's a mystery or like, they're going to steal something. It's like, how do you almost like engineer the fiction that makes that possible? That's like very fascinating. I, mean, I don't think I have those skills right now, but like, mm -hmm. mm, I also don't have like one in mind that I really want to write. And so I want to just like build those skills as I can. And uh, yeah, 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 it's not overwhelming. Nice. That's very cool. Yeah. Like I sort of, I sort of asked that question in order to, to say like the, yeah. In my experience with this is something like uh, trusting that I'll sort of never run out of ideas. Like, there's just always going to be, as long as I'm kind of always challenging myself in some sense, there's just always going to be sort of more, like just more stuff to write from. And so I, I have also been trying to just like write stuff as it comes to me. And there's one draft that's been kind of stuck for a month now because I was traveling, but it was like this idea that came to me in church and I was initially, I was like, I'm not a good enough writer to write this. And then I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to try to write it anyway. Uh, one of the things that makes me feel better. So like, I, I think I have, for me, I think I, I sometimes have had a fear that like, if I write about an idea, I'm like not allowed to go back to it again. Mm. Later. And feeling like each one is kind of like my only shot at it. But now I'm just like, what if that's just not true? Mm. Like I, I've sort of found like other authors who just kind of like go back to the same ideas over and over again. And they just, totally. they just do that. And, like No one has stopped them from doing that. And like, 
even to the point where there are authors who like publish famous short stories and then like rework their short stories later they like either rework them into a novella or rework them into a full novel and she's like oh that's just like the thing you're allowed to do as an author is great so i i relaxed a little about that mm. and i think like yeah, i think there's something really rich about just following inspiration even if you're like this i definitely am not good enough like you know hypothetically a better writer would do a much better job of, with this idea than i can but i'm gonna fucking do it anyway and like that'll like challenge me to grow as a writer and like i think if you kind of just keep going with the inspiration that comes up like just other even richer inspiration comes up later that seems to be how it works so totally pretty cool it's pretty cool pretty cool that works that way it's like it's pretty nice Uh uh-huh oh yeah i'm reminded of what it's like I do. I do, obviously do a lot of drawing, and and part of that part of the theme I've been on is like drawing beautiful women. And I know you like beautiful women yeah. as well. And uh, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> they're, they're, the beautiful women, brave and controversial stance. <laughs> brave and controversial stance. Here we are. We're saying the real stuff here, QC. <laughs> Several hours yeah. deep into the conversation. Uh, yeah. uh, but like, what it it actually? Well, it's funny that you say it because it, I think it actually does take bravery to draw a beautiful woman. Because especially as a poor artist like myself, just technically, is like rarely have I felt like the drawings I've done like begin to approximate the beauty of a beautiful woman and what it's like to be with a beautiful woman and uh, feel yeah. moved by her and, and her soul. I did. I mean, the soul is a whole other level. Like to convey oh, the, the whole the whole, thing. the whole thing. So, but like, but. You have to try, like you have, you have to, to try, try yeah. and like that. Yeah. One of the sub games of art for me is like get to the point where I can draw a beautiful one or a tree. I feel like trees are very similar for me. Like I don't feel mm-hmm. sexually attracted to trees, but the like qualitative <laughs> aesthetic, <laughs> the the qualitative aesthetic like density is very similar. Of just like holy shit, mm-hmm. trees are beautiful. Like then there's so much soul, even soul to a tree, and mm-hmm. um, and like. You just get there by trying. It's like, oh, I'll draw this beautiful woman. I'll draw this tree, whatever it is that, you know, maybe it's like birds for someone else or, you know, dogs or something or what, whatever it is. But um, you just like keep trying and trying. And yeah, I think it's the same with fiction. And um, there's like some number of things you're trying to say or felt senses you're trying to convey. And yeah, you might have to return to them again and again and be like, uh, we, we didn't get it that time, but good that we tried, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm also like, I, I want to go back a bit to mm. the thing that you said about like watching, having a phase where you were like watching a ton of movies. Mm. It's like, I think there's, there's something really interesting here. So I, I have been, been playing with this idea off and on that like a lot of, I think what people use the internet for, and like this includes like streaming services and stuff is as a substitute for their own imagination. Like, mm. It's hard to like there's this way so for example like i think that movies in particular are in a very strong sense dreams like they're the same length as rem cycles mm. and i was i remember there was a day where i just like found myself very struck by this fact right i was just like yeah whoa 90 minutes that's like how long a rem cycle is. <laughs> like I, I was i think i was watching a movie on acid when i was kind of struck by this idea it's just like wait this is like like this is kind of like someone else is like constructed a dream for me to enter like a film is a a film is a technology by which we can enter other people's dreams that's like nuts that's like pretty crazy and this is like an extremely common idea in film criticism or something like this is not if if i'd gone to film school i they would have taught me this you know but i didn't go to film school (laughs) i I I didn't go either so i'm like whoa what rem cycle yeah dream film, film is dream is apparently like a very common film analysis thing but anyway whatever like i didn't know that so i had to figure it out with drugs <laughs> but, but i was like oh shit yeah, these are just fucking dreams like we've invented a technology for transplanting our dreams into other people which is fucking crazy and like really helped me appreciate cinema as a medium and like just like wow this is like a crazy thing that we're able to do and there's a kind of like, like you can get lucky if you find a film that happens to speak to something very deep in you. Like you can be like, oh my God, this film like stirs things in me. And like, like, like there's a way that, that that can be kind of compensating for like, maybe you personally don't have very interesting dreams or you don't remember the, your dreams or you're like, don't have, don't have sort of an opportunity to, 
to like let your imagination really run free but but you can kind of borrow other people's imaginations through dream through film and through you know books and tv and all these other kinds of things like all these are kind of ways of borrowing other people's imaginations so i was thinking about this and so on the one hand there's a like like there's a it's it's a great service to be able to create a uh, uh a film or something else that really speaks to other people that like offers them something that maybe their own imagination would have difficulty offering them that's like very cool and on the other hand like you may find that that there's something very specific that you need that you just like can't find a work of art that it speaks to and then you're just like well fine maybe i just have to do it mm -hmm. and that could be as simple as like writing that could be as simple as coming up with like one clear you know focusing label for a felt sense just like okay i couldn't find one out there but so i'm able to generate on my own and up to like i just have to write a poem that expresses how i'm feeling up to like i just have to write like a twitter thread that expresses how i'm feeling or like a subset post that expresses how i'm feeling up to like i just have to write like a book that expresses how i'm feeling you know all of that can be can be like a thing that you realize that you need for yourself but then when you share it can also be of uh, of service to other people who have similar things going on that they can that they can mm. like come to come to engage with through mm. your arts yeah so that was a thought uh, that makes me think like i don't think i could start from a felt sense and then write a story from i think i can like do that with maybe a scene or a character or something like that like that's really helpful or i do yeah. that with art all the time but like this specific thing of trying to find a story that speaks to someone's or in this case my soul mm. like there's a reason why on the one hand certain stories tend to resonate you know i could tell you which movies i really liked or which novels i really like but on the other hand it's like oh i still haven't found the thing it's like i don't even i'll know it when i write it <laughs> but yeah, like yeah, yeah. i'm like there's something i want that i've never seen in any story ever that mm. that like I don't even know what it is. Uh, yeah, I'll yeah. let you know. Maybe you and I will have a podcast when we're like 80 <laughs> and we're both these badass <laughs> elders that have written fucking awesome novels and done whatever else it is that we do yeah, yeah, yeah. in our lives. And we're like, I wrote it. I found it, QC. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't have known it when I was 32, but boy, <laughs> sure did I find it. <laughs> I love that. That's so good. <laughs> that actually reminds me of something. Do you want to hear like a sad story? yes so I, I i tweeted about this so borges when he was mm. a teenager i think a teenager or something borges when he was a teenager had a traumatic sexual mm. experience had a traumatic sexual awakening where like like the uh, the details are like a bit uh there's like two conflicting accounts but like his dad like bought him a prostitute or something and he met up with her not knowing that she was a prostitute mm -hmm. and then they had sex or something and then he found out that she was a prostitute and then he like that his dad had bought for him and then he was like really fucked up about it he was like oh god like i i, I there's there's something in in the, in the excerpt about like like he was he was like oh did did she sleep with my dad <laughs> like there's some kind of crazy shit like that and like that experience traumatized him so much he was like unable to have sex for the rest of his life <laughs> Oof. and there's a whole book uh i'm trying to remember what it's called uh yeah it's called borges desire and sex mm. that just like talks about like kind of looking at looking through borges's work through this lens of like what was his relationship to sex and to women and once you take that lens it's very weird like there mm. are very few women in his stories there's almost no sex there are there's there's all these stories in which like in which like humans reproduce through some method other than sex like there are stories in which like dudes dream other dudes into existence and, stuff like that. and there's like you know um in in the library of babel which i think is one of his most well-known stories like there's a bunch of dudes around like there's no discussion of whether there's any women around there's like no discussion of where any of those dudes came from there's so much like all this funny like dudes just kind of exist but in a way that has nothing to do with sex or with women and once you kind of see this this uh this theme in his work you're just like oh or has probably had some feelings about sex and, women. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and like and i and like there's 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 a fucking the, the sad part i mean there's already a lot of quite sad stuff here but like one of the things that makes me sad is like 
there's there's an interview that Borges gave like towards the end of his life, like when he was pretty close to, to dying, where he like still describes being really fucked up about this experience that happened when he was a teenager or whatever. And like like it seems, I don't know, I don't I don't know if this is true, but it seems that he kind of never got over it. And that's like that's sad to me. I'm just looking at them just like, man, it's like you can write like some of the most celebrated literature in world history and still not like get over a terrible thing that happens to you Mm -hmm. when you Mm -hmm. were and that's like that's sad and and like like I wonder you know like I wonder if if there was a way in which Borges was was trying very indirectly to grope towards this theme because there is definitely like this this is a whole book there's like a whole book about this like I have to wonder if Borges was like trying to grope very indirectly towards some kind of like confrontation with sexuality and with women and if it just like never, it just like didn't quite happen. Like he didn't, he didn't go far enough or like no one kind of told him where to go. Or like, I don't know, like something, like I wonder if someone could have said something to him that could have helped him like actually, actually go through it somehow. What would you say to him if you could go back in time and oh, be like, oh, I, don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's so like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> it seems difficult, you know. He also there's another interview with Borges where he says something like that he like is not interested in in psychology and feels sorry for people who are interested in psychology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think I don't think Borges would have been very into therapy. Mm-hmm. So you know whatever Fair. it is, it would have to be like kind of in like in sort of his frame or something mm-hmm. you know, something that would that would appeal to him on his terms. And I don't Does know make you that. wonder what his frame was like? Man, he wrote some wonderful and very particular and very strange stuff. And it's yeah, like, where does that where come does, from? Where does that? Yeah, exactly. That's like a that's like a fascinating question to me. I'm just like, yeah, what does what does it take to to produce a for his? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So this is this is like a he's like he's an interesting case study for me. Mm-hmm. Just like yeah, what's what's going on? What's going on? Like on some level, it's reassuring, right? It's like, okay, you can produce beautiful art without resolving your shit. Like you can have tons of unresolved shit and still make beautiful art. That's mm-hmm. great. That's good to know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I do also wonder, like, how much better could it have been? I also, you know, I mm-hmm. wonder about the, the possibilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anything else in this territory or anything else we've talked about or something else that you'd like to talk about? probably i'm like i'm having a little trouble holding our conversation in my head because we just went through a bunch of stuff and i'm just like oh yeah that was good stuff now i'm I'm like (laughs) getting a little tired maybe Mm -hmm. so i was like oh oh yeah i'm like maybe running a little bit out of steam Mm -hmm. Uh, if you had suggestions for things to talk about, I'm sure I could generate words for much longer than this. Well, not much longer, but longer. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, there's something I'm thinking about. I'm just trying to how to put mm-hmm. words to it. Um, You told, yeah, you told me before we started recording that there was some relationship between God and devotion and vows and this whole like redoing Keegan stages thing that was like actively interesting to you and you wanted to maybe talk more about. And I'm, I don't know what the, yeah, what's interesting to you about all that stuff and how, I guess I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have flagged devotion or God directly to vows i mean it kind of makes sense but i yeah i don't know i'm curious what your curiosity there is and how you see that Mm. so it's related to this theme of commitment there is like a you know if you imagine what it's like i'm i'm i didn't have anything very specific in mind like i have again no cached words about this so i'm having Mm -hmm. to like talk about it in real time um if you imagine what it's like to be like a six-year-old, it's like, it's not, you're not committing to things as a six-year-old. Like your your job as a young child is just to explore and to like be taken care of by parents. Like that's your job. It's fine. That's like a completely fine place to be. 
And if you're redoing that part of your life, then again, like if you're redoing, yeah, if you're redoing being a young child, it's like not your job to commit to things yet. It's your job to explore and play and have fun and be attended to and like be heard and be seen and be cared for. And all of that is again fine and good. And like at some point, there's like some point in a child's life where like you start asking a child to take on responsibilities or something. Like you start asking them to start cleaning up or you start asking them to, you know, whatever, like whatever, whatever it means in your family and in your culture for a child to start taking on responsibilities. There's a point at which you start asking a child to take on responsibilities. And like if you're religious, for example, there's maybe a point at which you start sort of initiating your child more deeply into your religion, whatever that means. And so that is like a distinct there's something about that's like that's like a distinct phase of life uh there's something about like you know when you and then later in adolescence the part where you like go to college and major in something or the part where you just like try to find a job there's something there about like oh, now it's time to find out like what role i play in society and to like be able to you know when you have a job commit to like showing up to work on time and stuff like that and where am i going with this i i think i can connect this to devotion but it's going to be it might take a little while there's like like you can you can take on a job for sort of for all kinds of different reasons right you can be like oh this the work is interesting or like oh the job pays really well or like oh this job is like really high status and i'm gonna like feel good about myself if i have this job or whatever and then maybe like like i think a lot of teapot people have this experience of like burning out on work one way or another like something about their job wasn't satisfying or something about it like required them to to exert too much internal force then they just like couldn't handle it after a while and then you know then maybe you take a sabbatical or you just quit and you're just like i'm just not working at work anymore i'm gonna like level off with my savings and try to find myself or whatever and like if you go through a period of like that especially if you go through a period like that and then you end up depressed like at some point it becomes this very live question of like kind of why should i do anything at all right like there's kind of a there's like a nihilism question that can come up. Like, is there kind of any, was there any point to me working other than like just keeping myself alive or like, what was kind of the point of all that stuff? Like, why did I do all, like, why did I, for me, it's like, why did I go to grad school? Like, what was the point of doing that? And then that's sort of a past question. And then there's sort of a future question. That's like, what should, why should I do anything in the future? Like, what's the point of like, what is it that could possibly compel me to like go back to having a job now that I've discovered that I hate it so much. Um, and these, these are real questions, I think. And people are, it's, these are hard, it's hard, it's hard to, to answer. These are hard questions to answer. And I think a lot of people can get stuck in like this sort of pit of depression and nihilism and despair where they're just like, well, I don't see any reasons to do it, to do stuff or to like work hard. Like there's just sort of nothing that, that, that nothing that's compelling enough. And I'm just going to sit on my ass and do nothing for a while. And I don't think that's wrong per se. Like, I think if you do feel that way, it it may, it's, you know, you may or may not find that you can force yourself to work and do things anyway. And so for me, God and devotion are very relevant to this question of like, what is it that could possibly compel me? Not, com not compel in the sense of force, but compel in the sense of like finding something compelling. Like, what is it that could move me to do difficult things and to work hard in the world uh, and to or, or to like to like find a way of working in the world that like is acceptable to me that like balances between you know my desires for independence and my need to like keep myself fed and alive and stuff and sort of my suspicion about at least some people in teapot and i don't know how many is that like they're not really going to find a satisfying answer to that question until they find in your in your terms like what their vow is like whatever that is the thing that they can like really devote themselves to and commit to like 
I think there is some kind of developmental thing. There's a point at which that's not an appropriate question to ask of a person. Like hmm. a young child shouldn't be thinking about this, but there's a point at which it becomes an appropriate question to ask. Like, what are you willing to devote your life to? And I think there are people around here who are shaped such that they won't really be able to engage with the world until they find something that they can devote themselves to. And I think that I have had to find something like this. Like I've had to find some kind of a vow, some kind of a, like something that I feel capable of devoting myself to. And that like, that's sort of like my answer to burnout or something. It's like, what's sort of the opposite of burnout? It's devotion, maybe. Mm. Uh, finding something that you like care about enough that you're willing to, to put in tremendous amounts of effort for it. This is not, yeah, this is not, um, this is very half-baked, but those are some, those are some words about that. Hmm. Hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. I was going to ask, you know, you're like, oh, in your terms of vow, and I was going to be like, oh, what, what are your terms? And you're like, oh, it's devotion. Yeah. What, what, what are you willing to commit to and devote yourself to? And that makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Or on River's terms, I, I had in mind kind of other, like River has this thing that is like, uh, you don't choose the gods you belong to. So mm -hmm. I think in, in reverse terms, we could talk about like discovering what God belong to. Like, ah, okay, here's here's my guy. Mm -hmm. like, you know, okay, I'm gonna like serve my guy now. Um, yeah, I, this is it's this is tricky stuff to talk about because the language for talking about it is like it's self part of the thing. Like some mm -hmm. people will resonate a lot more with thou, and some people will resonate a lot more with God, and it's just gonna be, you know, whatever. Like all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. it makes me interested about like from a developmental perspective when it is appropriate to begin to broach these questions and and how you do that and how people find that and i mean that's yeah that's part of my own life's work is empowerment and helping people to find this and i think mm -hmm. there's things i i really don't understand about this yet that i'm still trying to work out and yeah yeah yeah, some of it seems developmental of like where people are at and people are at really different places and people yeah, are also yeah. just radically singular, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. nobody could have come to you and like the, what you, you know, we, we've heard your life story on record now, you know, like, the, like <laughs> there wasn't a, a, like a book written for Chow Chu about how to live Chow Chu's life in particular, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 Something about like there's so many yeah there's so many ways to like give advice that just doesn't generalize to people you just like oh people should just do x and then for everything like that there's like one person who's like exactly the opposite that's like exactly the opposite of what they need to do and that's stuff gets really thorny and i think people either ignore that stuff or kind of give up on it and i think it is actually possible to like try to give reasonably broad advice but you just have to like keep going kind of up the chain like instead of being like you should do x it's more like you should discover what it is that like like what if you tried discovering like what it is that really thrills you to do and then go do that like the like the quote the the quote that's like uh instead of asking what the world needs ask what makes you come alive and then go do that because what mm -hmm. the world needs is people who have come alive like that's it's a little bit of a cheesy motivational quote but i really believe that i'm just like yeah that's just true I'm that's just, just like, how it I is like, kind of think that's what people should do <laughs> like, yes. and there's a question of kind of repackaging that insight in different ways that can resonate with different people like i think i think people people can kind of get into this have this worry that like oh like i don't have anything to say like everyone else already says all these really insightful things and i would just be kind of regurgitating there's like a lot of value in regurgitating things like you you kind of can't help but say things in your own way like in your own language in terms that make sense to you in a framework that makes sense to you like, and every time you kind of attempt to regurgitate the ancient wisdom like you end up like it hits a different group of people than before so like i don't i'm i'm totally fine with us like with like everyone writing their own book and it's like on some level maybe they'll all be the same book but that's fine they'll just mm -hmm. they'll just they'll be they'll be very different they'll reach very different audiences they'll resonate with very different people because we are very different people and that's just like good i'm just okay with that like we should all just write like on some level the book project that i'm thinking of is just going to be a version of visa's introspect and on some level it's just going to be a version of Marx global wayfinding but it's also going to be an extremely different book from both of those 
And even if it theoretically covers very similar territory, it's just going to appeal to and reach and help a very different set of people. And I'm just like, yeah, this is great. We should just all write our own version of whatever this book is. It's fine. It's not a problem. Mm. Yeah. Where does that stand for you now? Uh, where does what stand for me now? Writing that book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I get like the last time I thought about this, I was like, I guess I'll write a bunch of stuff on Substack that is sort of drafts of chapters in the book mm -hmm. and i still want to do that that's just kind of been on the back burner because in the meanwhile i have all these other subsec drafts so it's mm -hmm. like uh yeah i guess the concrete problem is that working on the book has not felt urgent and meanwhile it's felt like i have a bunch of i've had a bunch of like kind of random urgent things to do mm -hmm. and so it's it, it i have not yet learned the arts of balancing urgent things with important things that are mm. not urgent. that is mm. i don't know how to do that yet mm. it's tricky I gotta, I gotta figure out how to like you know set aside some time specifically to work on on like more long-term stuff mm. i'll mm. learn how to do that mm. yeah. well it's been uh really wonderful to talk about all this with you. I think there's such a huge range of stuff we covered and uh, yeah. it's all kind of interlocking and I'm glad that you've shared your heart and your thoughts about all this stuff with me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Those are, these were really wonderful questions to try to answer. I felt like I got to clarify a lot of stuff that's on my current edge to myself. Mm. Your questions. So that was like very helpful. Mm. I'm thank so you. glad friend. Yeah.